are out there anyway, but I'll try it. Uh, I'll try to do, talk about something useful. Uh, my name is Lee Goldberg, as you know. Uh, I wouldn't consider myself a deep expert on electric vehicles, but it's one of three revolutions I've covered in the course of my career as a tech journalist. I was originally an electrical technician, then an electrical engineer. And uh, I worked, uh, Skip Osborne, are you up, out here somewhere? He, there you are. I worked with this guy back back in the, in the, in the late 80s. And he was one of the people that convinced me that I should find another profession because everybody is working with was smarter and better at it than I was. Um, you know, they, but uh, are you going to be, are you going to be the banquet? Okay, then I will tell the story now. And this is off track, off topic or anything else. And it, I, I got very lucky and ended up working on spacecraft for about eight years. And the first thing I worked on was um, a geosynchronous communication satellite. And I was the technician who manned this crude, sorry, this huge bank of equipment, computers and power supplies and everything else. I'll try to make this quick. Anyway, the sp a spacecraft starts out as an assortment of boxes, electrical boxes, all strung out on a table with big wiring harness. I mean, you know, long, thick as your arm and all these boxes are connected. And at the time it doesn't, you know, when it's not in orbit, it has to be powered by something. So that was my checkout station. We had a bunch of programmable supplies and we were in the middle of bringing up power for the first time on the bus. And we got 30, 40, $50 million worth of spacecraft spread out in front of you. You want to do this kind of carefully, right? And so what you do is you first bring the power up to about a half volt or one volt to check for shorts. And you're, you're kind of looking at the current consumption and a bunch of other stuff. And then slowly you bring it up and all of a sudden, oh, you think. Um, so you, you, um, you bring it up and at some point, this is a 28 volt bus. And somewhere, I, I can't remember, it's in the dim reaches of time. At some voltage, all of a sudden the little converters inside each box start keying, you know, and start feeding the five and 12 volts and whatever else to the different parts of the box. And because you've got several million dollars worth of boxes, this is done in a very painstaking procedure. So we are about two and a half hours into a four hour procedure when we finally get to the point where Skip is test conductor. And you know, and we're all very buttoned down, steely eyed missile people, you know, and doing this. And, you know, at about the two and a half hour mark, I think, I don't remember really, um, you know, half a volt at a time, looking at the currents on the different buses. All right, all right, let's go up another. You know, and he says, All right, give me some more voltage. And the devil comes over me. Captain, I cannot do it. I cannot. I've got turbos. <laughs> God bless Skip, a button down, you know, engineer with his, without missing a beat. Damn it, Scotty, I need more power. <laughs> I can, but I don't know how long she'll hold together. And then the test proceeded for the next hour and a half <laughs> without skipping a beat. And I said, I have found my people. <laughs> this one's for you, Skip. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm just so glad you showed up. And we, I've been waiting 30 years to tell that story to somebody. <laughs> so let me see, where did I, where did I put myself here? Oh, ah. Uh, so I left, I left tech, I left being an engineer because I really, I was reasonably good, but I didn't think I could make a contribution. So I spent the last 30 years, years or so covering it. And I've had the good fortune to cover several revolutions, the networking revolution, the LED revolution, like from where we had hundred dollar light bulbs, LED light bulbs to what we have today and all the crazy things you can do with that. And I covered networking when 10, 10 megabits was huge and fast up through. And uh, I covered Wi-Fi when it was a theoretical thing and they were using 
uh, RF to get four megabits a second and infrared. So I've watched a few revolutions come. And one of the ones I'm watching now, and I'm not stuck in the middle of it, even though I'm not as technically knowledgeable as I'd like, I'd like to give you my observations from what's going on with the EV revolution. Uh, now, oh, I'm gonna just go back to my notes. Although I'm a pretty hardcore tree-hugging, granola-munching environmentalist, I know many of my readers are not. So instead of doing a lot of moralizing and good for you stuff about the impact of the planet, which is actually one of my big focuses, I'm gonna try to give you more about what's really interesting and cool. Uh, and, but I will, will try to touch briefly on the role that EVs and related technologies will play to creating a vibrant, sustainable economy for your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But I'm not gonna preach at you today. I'll do my best to not. Uh, so uh, what I'm, here's a sampler of what I'm talking. It, not just being good for you, the electric uh, revolution will bring as much cooler cars and trucks that can do things that fossil burners cannot. And here, if the, for, if the, if the manufacturers don't cheap out, we're good, we can have cars that require, because, because of the nature of the vehicle, require much less maintenance, run for quarter million, half million miles without much more than, uh, you know, changing some mechanical things out. Uh, you, you know, nobody would ever thought about having a rolling power source that can be used to back up your home instead of buying a separate power wall and also serving as a source of revenue to sell power back to the utility companies, stuff like that. Um, nowadays, people are, people are jet buying sedans that deliver what supercars, muscle cars, deliver the kind of performance that muscle cars used to deliver at a fraction of the price. Okay, you know, I mean, we're now taking zero to 60 in two and a half seconds is relatively normal. I mean, I can't wait to get one, um, you know. And then fun, one of the ones I'm tracking, we'll probably talk about it later, uh, fun, we can make much less expensive cars if anybody gets it in their mind and there is at least one manufacturer, something that costs twenty five to $30,000 that can, and the one I'm talking about, which is kind of on the, uh, the far right of the screen, can actually get some mileage. I'm not sure it's quite the 40 miles they say on a good day uh, out of the solar panels embedded in their thing. I like them because the, 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 uh, the cabin looks like a cockpit in a really nice airplane. But uh, that's besides the point. So let's see here. Okay, brace yourselves. This is the obligatory good for you slide. Okay, just to tell you why I'm so hyped about it. Um, EVs will make it possible to cut greenhouses. Adopting EVs widely could allow us to cut greenhouse gases by 22% alone. And that's not counting buildings. That's not counting anything else. We could drop our gases by that much. Uh, and I'm, I'm having a hard time here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, the left, the left-hand sec, uh, segment in pie, pie chart is like transportation overall. Uh, shows you that's 25%, but most of it, you know, is in light-duty vehicles, medium and heavy-duty vehicles, and other stuff. So, and that's all the stuff that's EV territory. So that's about 22%. And what they're not telling you is that what they're not factoring, and it's fair, that um, this isn't even counting on the energy required to extract, refine, and transport fuel for gasoline cars. So that 22% is nice and conservative. I, I figure we're gonna have fossil burners. I think we're gonna have fossil burners, you know, in the fleet for quite a while. It, you know, it's gonna take a while to taper out, but it, they'll make a big impact. So that's, that's enough lecturing. I'm sorry about that. I just had to get that in and why I'm so psyched. Um, Can you do something to get those um, um, uh, Parker's uh, remote yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, right here in the corner. Top 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 the screen. Screen. What? Yeah, I see it. I, I, do we have our tech person here? Is there anybody who's 
Look at the top, top right hand corner, there's three dots. Yeah, more. More. Look at those three dots. Yeah. More. And drop down to. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, ah, thank you for spotting that. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm so I'm just freaking out up here. I'm barely keeping it together, and I wasn't noticing that. Now, look, I, having covered, yes. Sorry, I was wondering if you could do a survey here and see how many people drive a car that's older than 15 years old. Right. That's. Can we put that off till? Remind me, I have, I've got an audience feedback time. No, there's going to be a taper off, but at some point, as the cost of driving an EV, uh, a fossil burner, gets higher and higher, you know, and there are reasons. I look, I'm still driving. I've got a hybrid, and I couldn't afford to buy, and I couldn't afford to buy, uh, so I got a, a fuel efficient truck because I need a sedan and a hauler, and I don't, you get out of here, will you please? Hold on. We'll 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 just keep whack. We'll play whack a mole here. Um, hi, hi, yep. hi, 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 Yeah. So here's the thing. This has been one of the interest, most interesting parts of my job covering. I accidentally find myself in the middle of revolutions of various kinds. So this has nothing to do with electric cars, or it might not seem like it. I found myself in the middle of the solar panel revolution. Um, for many reasons. And so actually I was at a networking show because I was covering networking in San Jose in 08. And I think it was 07 or 08. Anyway, there was the solar show, the National Solar Show down in San Jose itself. And I was up in um, Santa Clara at the convention center covering my thing. I said, well, shit, I'll take a day off. You know, I'm not going to, you know, because this was at a time where nobody was interested in this stuff. But I, I shuttled down. And it was pretty interesting. I'll get you again. I'll just leave the, I'll leave the thing wherever. Um, so I, I come down and everybody, you know, it's a great show. It's interesting and things, you know, this is when cost was about, you know, three bucks a watt, four, three, four bucks a watt. Come on, get out of here, will you please? Hi, hi, Dave. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, hi, names of annotations. No, no, I, I don't know why they're, they keep doing that. We'll just keep whack a mole it. Anyway, and I'm coming out at the end of the day, and everybody's, they're slapping themselves on the back, and whoa, this is awesome. We had 2,500 people at this show. That's double last year. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. You know, and so I happen to find myself at, in the next year, San Jose. And I, I take a day off. I deliberately schedule an extra day. Vinod Coastal is there this year. All of a sudden, 8,000 people. And at that point, um, they ran out of room at the Santa Clara Convention Center, the San Jose Convention Center. It ends up the next year, it was down... In in um, outside of Los Angeles, where there was the Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth was Queen Elizabeth was parked, and the Spruce Goose, and they had like God knows it was significant, and they had booths sprawling out into the convention center lobby area and everything else. At that point, the next year, I was or the year after, I somehow accidentally found myself doing a, a, a solar project in Pakistan putting solar panels on school roofs uh, for reasons I won't bore you with. It was really a, a wonderful experience as a nice Jewish boy to visit Pakistan. I met so many wonderful people. That, and I went in to go find vendors, American vendors. It was in LA at the Staples Center, overflowing with 32,000 people. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this is, if you notice, by that time, 2010, things had gone down. There's a phenomenon. As prices drop, you get a demand, you get a demand spike. And if I'm going, somebody, if I'm going on too long, somebody just do this and I'll, I'll continue the next slide, I swear. I, I get excited about this, but I don't know how many people do. As price dropped, all of a sudden around 08, 09, 
price went up to the point where it hit a, a tipping point where people could actually, it made economic sense, not just moral sense in most places, to start buying it. As the price hit, demand went nuts. I just didn't have enough slides. It started going crazy to the point where, at that point, they were making solar panels out of the same wave silicon wafers that they make back, back you. Um, they, out, out of the same, they, they were using the same silicon wafers that they made uh, integrated circuits, computer chips out of. At which point, all of a sudden, at that demand level, they were competing with <laughs> Intel for wafers. Um, and it crossed this incredible silicon shortage. And if you notice, there's kind of a flattening off point at around uh, 09 to 2011. That's where the silicon, where the solar panel industry was throttled by, and they had to learn it was one of the best things that ever happened to them. The first thing that they did was they, they learned that they could make solar panels with a lower grade of silicon, not quite as pure as the ones required for, for, um, for chips. Yeah, for semiconductor, well, for, yeah, for chips. And it's called metallurgical grade, a lot cheaper to produce. The other thing they discovered is we don't have much of this crap lying around. We got to slice it real thin like bologna. And so it went from these fairly thick wafers and they would pick them up with a machine, oh, place them like that. And these things got so thin, they would start waffling. So they had to change the vacuum truck to hold the whole wafer because you could see the, the wafers on your on your panels today are so thin you can sit there, they're like thin, thin enough you can just wobble them around. So they learned a lot of stuff about how to make the same number of watts with less silicon, including making them more efficient. And that's why all of a sudden, so then you see the the sudden steepening around 2011 when supplies opened up and you hit a buck a watt, all of a sudden demand took off. And now we're at, well, uh, two years ago, we were at 27 cents a watt for, for because of this, this crazy phenomenon. We sort of saw, I won't try to go into it, but a similar thing with networking, but this is just one of those brilliant examples. Um, and we're sort of at that funny tipping point with electric vehicles. And I'm gonna start setting funny if I don't do this. Sorry, funnier. Um, come on, where are you? Oh, wait, no. Go to the next slide. Yeah, there, there it is, okay. So on top of, so we've had a number of factors that are accelerating the acceptance of EV that are driving down the price, that are improving the performance. And here's just a handful of them as soon as I kick off that stupid ass. Excuse my potty mouth. Well, we're gonna have to, I don't know. Everybody else has a short shortcut. You can do it Okay, so what we have is, much like one of the things that, that helped solar panels really take off was demand picked up to a moderate point where economies of scale, you could build large factories, high volume, and start to do. The other thing is that we've witnessed, oh, and the other thing about solar, solar panels was incrementally, the efficiency was going up. So you could make the same wafer uh, and it would be producing 5% five, 5 more power than it did last year. So you could build a panel that was, you know, we, when I was, when I first started covering this stuff and looking for panels to put on school roofs in Lahore, Pakistan, we were, you know, 125 watt, 125 to 200 watts was like, 200 watts was like super panels. You know, and now we're talking three to 300 plus watts. Same, virtually the same cost of production. We're seeing that with conventional lithium ion batteries. They're making incremental progress on that. Um, and right behind just fine tuning the existing, the existing uh, technology, there are some very interesting battery technologies, three quarters of which were, are not gonna make it economically. They're just not gonna, but there's gonna be that 25% that will. Um, who here's, I, I know you're, you're familiar with semiconductors. I saw you nodding before. Um, 
but I want to talk, there's something called wide band gap semiconductors. Um, basically, silicon's great. I mean, it, it's an amazing thing. We've been using it for uh, a lot of years to make transistors, but it, 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 it has some issues, especially at higher powers. So there are now two uh, competitors that have entered, entered the market for high power, high frequency applications. One is called silicon carbide. Yes, it's the same stuff that you use on your circular saw, just a little bit fancier, and gallium nitride. Um, perhaps the most notable thing about them is uh, when you when you have a silicon a silicon a silicon power transistor, especially high power ones, they have a certain amount of loss between one side and the other, between the gate and grain or the you know, and it's. It's just the cost of doing business. Um, and that gets whatever whatever losses they have get turned into heat. So you have on these big, um, the power controls for your, for your uh, whether, it's, whether it's an electric vehicle, like a, a, a car or a locomotive, you have these huge heat sinks, big aluminum things and your fans and all that. Um, silicon carbide gallium nitride are less than 10% of those losses. They run very cool. And with silicon carbide even, it's absolutely happy running it at temperatures that would fry a normal transistor. It's just crazy stuff. They have their problems and they're not the easiest things to work with, but they're getting easier. And those are the, so we're seeing more and more electric vehicles and other high power applications using these, what once were very exotic, devices on a regular basis. And that means, you know, let's say you, you lose, pick up 3% less heat, but so it allows you, first of all, to 3% less law, you know, 3% more of the power in your batteries goes to driving the car than to heating up, heating up the cooling system in the car. Uh, is what it is. See, you've just gotten 3% mi a mileage boost or 4%, sometimes more, for free. Meanwhile, because they don't use these huge heat sinks, they can be smaller, require less cooling, less expensive to build, even though the transistors themselves are a bit more expensive. And that's, we're right at the tipping point where silicon carbide is actually cheaper to use for, or on the overall system, even though. Um, Sorry, I hope I didn't get too deep in the weeds, but it's going to be, it's, it's made such a huge difference. Public perceptions of EVs, EVs has changed. And, you know, we can thank, even though I have my, my issues with them, you know, Elon Musk, you know, having a car that would go from zero to hundred and back in what, I don't, I don't remember what the sports car did, you know, and he's just been busting myths about it. And all of a sudden everybody's taking up the challenge and now EVs are sexy. And they're fun and they're interesting despite their limitations because it's a new, as they're telling this gentleman down here, we're still in the crystal set days, you know, I mean, uh, in a number of years. And, you know, to be honest, uh, government policies are helping move. There's that valley of, of death that you have during an adoption curve where and this is moving it past that tipping point by providing some incentives for a short time. Uh, to the point where they'll be more economically viable. So anyway, those are the accelerators. I hope I didn't bore you to death, I apologize. Okay, uh, as I said, you know, we're not living in EV nirvana at the moment. It is still not easy being green. You know, for one thing, um, batteries, battery prices are high, there's still, 30 to 35 percent typically of the cost of a vehicle, you know, which is significantly more than the cost of a, a gasoline motor, you know, uh, price of the car. But they've been falling steadily. When I drove Nissan's uh, for a type of electric minivan in 2000, uh, which cost over $100,000, I forget what it was, uh, but I, I was scared to death driving it. Um, you know, they accounted for significantly over half of the cost of this prototype, you know, with just the batteries lurking in the bottom of the car. Um, 
And as late as 2016, batteries still accounted for 49%. Uh, but even that, even with batteries currently accounting for 30 plus percent of vehicle cost, any improvement in their price has a big effect on EV affordability. So those incremental costs I was talking about, they're gonna be coming down. Um, most of today's batteries still require significant amounts of lithium, cobalt, nickel, and other strategic materials. I note the difference. I use strategic materials. Um, they talk about rare earth. That's a different class of material. Uh, sometimes they're both hard to get. Uh, when I say strategic, it's things that are mined in places that by people who might not like us so much, you know, the, where the market is dominated by that, or in some cases where they're mined by slave labor, like coal is, uh, is a conflict mineral. And there is some amazing, I don't have, I'm not a super knowledgeable, but I've been watching and there's a lot of work on, on chemistries that are getting around that. Um, and then, oh yeah, many EV motors required uh, amounts of uh, rare earth minerals. Those are things like neodymium, dysprosium, terbium. They're called rare earths. Some of them aren't actually rare. Yes. Um, uh, this for a few months or years. Um, we can do what the alchemists used to think they could do back then. We can take bigger molecules and controllably fission them. Wouldn't we be able to produce more lithium in the lab? Well, I mean, but it's it, um, at, at atomic weight. Lithium is now. You you need. To, we're still fission. Fission involves micrograms, um, you know, and we need megatons or kilotons, megatons of, you know, of stuff. It's technically true, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, yeah, no, we better be looking, you know, it's probably more practical to start working on the lithium crystals for Scotty. Um, but no, it's not, a, it's not a dumb question. You know, here's another big problem, but it's, you know, capitalism is solving it. Charging stations are still scarce in parts. Around here, I defy you to have a problem because, you know, within 60 miles of here, it's like charger heaven, you know. And there are large parts of the country, metro areas, you're fine. But just start getting out into some of the less populated areas or some of the areas that think that, you know, electric vehicles, or, you know, whatever. It hasn't happened yet, but I, I watched the Wi-Fi revolution. I actually wrote a whole article on driving cross country uh, with a family member testing the Wi-Fi infrastructure back in the, I'm not talking about it, but you know, where it was still, you had to be very careful about where, cause I was filing stories every night and I had to be very careful. I had a hotel that had Wi-Fi, and we'll see this. And I don't, I don't have a lot of information about this. You know, and oh, yeah, by the way, did I manage to mention that EVs batteries still need improvement? I mean, this is probably, there, there are tons of issues, but this is probably at least from what, from limit, my limited knowledge. Uh, oh, so speaking of that, yeah, uh, well, let's get rid of that. It's okay, it's not hurting. It's yeah, okay. Um, does this curve look a little familiar? Does anybody recognize this curve? Is this solar panels? No, no, it's batteries. Okay, funny, funny about this. They're awfully, now I've watched this show before. It's not my first rodeo. And this is why if I, if I seem like a rah-rah booster, I'm, I'm very aware of the economic and the, and the political and all that, but I'm looking at this, you know, and thinking to myself, I've seen this happen before. When I'm a private pilot now, I go flying, and one of my big fun sports is spotting solar farms because it just is shocking. I'm going, I couldn't believe this. It almost looks like science fiction. You know, there's, we are, it's now to the point where we have around 80 to 90% of the technology we need to create a sustainable and vibrant economy. You know, now it's a matter of economic and political will. And solar panels look like that. All of a sudden, here we got. Oh, let me see. What do my notes say? Much like the huge demand, the huge surge in uh, demand for solar uh, panels outstrip the supply for silicon. The battery industry is addressing the temporary lithium shortage in two ways. 
I'm sorry, I'm just reading from my notes. But it's true, you know, we're we're gonna see that same thing where batteries like the last two years, you know, that's been that and silicon chips have been the thing that have been keeping us from being able to go down to the store and buy a car, you know, especially in electric. Um, but several large lithium deposits have been discovered in North America, India, and other friendly countries who don't hate us. And and work is already underway to develop them. It's gonna be a while. You can't just bring in a mine on a mine and a refining center too. But it's it's underway. In addition, work is continuing on increasing the energy density of lithium ion batteries, i.e., less uh less less lithium per kilowatt hour stored so as much like we got more more watt out kilowatt hours out of silicon we're going to be doing the same thing with lithium and then right behind that is a general another step function of either lithium free or low lithium batteries it's kind of interesting i'll i'll try to touch on it without boring you to death um step function one is there's a whole class. I just finished up an article um, on battery technologies, and it was it was a, a fairly thin overview. But you know what can you say in two thousand words, right? But there's there are at least a dozen companies now um, that are working on technologies to replace the to use existing battery manufacturing facilities, jack out. 10 to 20% of the manufacturing machinery and put something else in and deliver 20, 30, 40% more capacity for the same thing. One of the big things that I won't bore you with the, the, the details here is that, um, did I say anything in here about that? Um, okay, most, Lithium batteries use carbon for at least one and usually two of their electrodes where the lithium accretes during charge and then gets depleted from. And they found out that silicon will hold a whole lot more lithium. And so you can, you can actually increase the capacity of the battery for the same size. Um, there are problems with it. Just when they tried to do it, just by replacing it with simple electrode structures, the batteries would swell and then contract. And it would, you know, so you'd get 25 to 100 charge cycles out of thing. And that's not particularly useful. But they've been doing some things. I'm just, I'm just in the middle of working on a couple of stories about unique electrode structures, and I'm not going to bore you with it, that managed to do that. Oh, and the other cool thing is that... Um, in an upcoming story, I've got a picture of somebody drilling through a lithium ion battery. And, well, and it, it not only does it keep working mostly, it doesn't catch fire. So these new structures are gonna be, um, are gonna be better, it, safer, contain higher, you know, contain higher density of energy and survive more charge cycles, okay? Um, and just, this was sort of an almost random, well, anyway, there are novel battery architectures that use even lift, less lithium right behind that. They're going to need new factories. Some of them use different chemistries. There's a, there's a whole, I, I can't even keep track of the number of companies that are developing solid state batteries. No liquid in them at all. It's just solid state electrolyte. Um, and some of them use cheaper materials, like really common sulfur, aluminum. Uh, and that's, in this case, the one I'm talking about here is you look at the bottom, the, the ion, or the, I don't know how to pronounce it. That's, that's one of a half dozen. And then if you go look at what MIT is doing and the National, uh, National Energy Labs, there's, it's going to be a while. Don't hold your breath for these, but they're, uh, the, uh, th that one sulfur lithium ion is going to be in small, in small battery packs in the next three years. But don't expect to have a sulfur EVs anytime soon, but they're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt. We pause this for one more good for you slide. Uh, um, one of the interesting things that one of my big heroes, Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute, pointed out is 
that there are regenerative effects when you, a lot of unintended consequences from, from, come from technical advantages. Once the cost and, and performance of electric, uh, of, of batteries comes down to a certain point, you start opening up interesting, interesting possibilities that you hadn't really intended to, because all of a sudden another industry discovers that, oh, we've got all this technology. We didn't have to pay a penny to have it developed. All we have to do is figure out how to use it, you know? And in this case, I mean, I'm a pilot, so yeah, I'm going to freak out. That you're looking at the top photo is of the world's first electric airliner that's probably going to be coming into service in Cape Cod in two or three years. Nine passengers. They claimed a 500 mile range when it was first introduced. It's been jacked down to 250 miles, but it costs a tenth the cost to operate. The, the engines, unlike turbine engines, have an almost infinite amount of time between overhauls and cost a lot less. Um, it recharges in a reasonable amount of time, and most of those are short hops. Now, this is limited by the capacity and weight of the current batteries. As they get bigger, range will go up and there'll be another another generation and there'll be other other vehicles. So electric airliners are going to lag, but there you are. There's the first one. It, I, I got to watch the first test flight, you know, over the internet. And it's been very exciting. So anyway, then lower right, there are a lot of short haul vessels that are starting to use batteries, store energy, rather than the bunker oil that is the bane of our existence. And then on the left, and that's probably the most interesting thing, one of the things that sucks about solar and wind is they're intermittent. And until we have a way to store some of that buffer, that energy, to take care of peaks, and then there's this other fun phenomenon where about the time that, so, that solar starts to roll off because it's the end of the day and the, the sun's kind of heading down is about the time everybody turns on their air conditioners, okay? So you've got about a two hour, you know, two or three hour lag where your sun's going down and, and, people, and demand is going up. So what do you do, you know? Well, you get a bunch of AA batteries. No, no, you can't. But guess one interesting thing about electric vehicle batteries is they're considered replaceable when they hit the, the 85 to 80% mark. Now they're still in good shape. And do we smelt them down right at that point? No, you buy them for pennies on the dollar, you rack them and stack them inside a cargo container and create inexpensive grid scale storage. And this has been going on now for quite a while. And when you put them there, where you, you can afford to limit, you know, you don't have to worry about weight, you can afford to keep them inside a much narrower charge discharge range and in a nice climate controlled environment, they're gonna last. They're gonna have lifetimes measured in decades. You know, it's a nice investment for, for, for utility companies. You can stretch it out. And then there's other, there's other types of storage, but that's one, and they're not gonna be enough used EV batteries in the foreseeable future to completely satiate the need for you know, grid scale storage, but it's definitely going to help drive down the cost and drive up the demand, you know, drive up the, the use for it. So, you know, as long as you don't have a collision with your, your car, when they come out, when they come out of your car, they're going to find a second life for 10, 20. I wouldn't speculate on how much more. Meanwhile, there is a lot of work being done on recycling. I was having a nice talk with this gentleman about that. So, this is the good for you slide. I'm sorry about that. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot. This is what the curve, the demand curve looks like. Um, you know, that's a blowout of the other one. That's the part we care about because it's, you know, but there's a demand curve and an availability curve on, and it's gigawatts. It's gigawatt scale, you know, once enough, EVs enter the market and serve, and the, and the batteries serve their term in the car. So I've gotten done with the talking at you. I've got a couple of questions. So you had, you had before we start this one, what was the question you had? Here. 
I have a car older than 15 years old. Oh, three. Oh, oh, nine. Oh, nine. Not quite. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. My Honda Element. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. How many years has a car older than 15 years? And your point was? And this is that how are you going to introduce new cars when so many people want to keep their old cars? Well, wanting and having to and can't afford can't afford to. No, not can't afford to. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying at some point. When there are enough EVs, look, I'm, I'm a big EV proponent. On a journalist's salary, I have not been able to afford one. The best I've been able to do is an 09 Prius. But I'm rapidly seeing a day where the cost, the, they're going to intersect. Yes. I was going to say that my car is 21 years old. My wife and I were talking about, well, what are we going to do? Going to keep fixing it? And I said, keep fixing it until top of the engine breaks. Or we finally throw in the towel and get solar and buy and start, start charging, charging, right? Start and charging. I think we'll see. I, I don't think I'm going to charge until I get solar on the house. And yeah, we're not ready for that yet. And the car keeps running. Yeah, and, and the car gets sick. We got two cars. We'll be down to one car family because we don't drive either one very far during the year. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, but once we're down to and one, we'll pull. probably be accelerating the plan for solar and we'll start. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, I think some other people may be in a similar boat. Is there just hanging Oh, yeah, no, there's going to be. Why buy a new gas hog when I'm going to buy an EV shortly? Someday, right, yeah. There's this along and keep fixing Oh, and that's where, that's the mode I've been in. I, you know, so I don't, I'm not expecting this, but I think at some point you're going to see a step function where as fuel goes up, as EV costs go down, even recharging it off my home at 12 cents a kilowatt. Is going to be a lot cheaper than you know. Um, even if I can't, I've I, I would have had solar panels on my house years ago, but I, we have shade, and I'm, I've been working through what it's going to take to deal with the shade. But um, no, it's a good question. So just to build on that, I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, this I ran a poll question to my readers uh, uh, just before the holidays. Uh, actually, a couple of. Them. And so I'm going to put up to you. Who here would be, who already here has an EV or a PHEV? Plug-in hybrid. Okay. How many of you are considering buying one in a year? In two to four years. Yeah, that's that's about right. Yeah, it's, and then uh, five plus years. And then, uh, and you know, I respect this, never. The only EV you will catch me in is the hearse. I'll ride when you, after my cold, probably my cold dead fingers from my beautiful V8 powered. I love, I love internal combustion engines. It's just, just not an everyday thing. It's like a treat, you know, like heats or hot fun Sundays. But, you know, how many people here just don't have any interest in electric vehicles? Fair enough. Good. Uh, I'll show you what my readers. You guys profile it pretty good. Um, there, you know, this is slightly, you guys are slightly laggards on my readers. But I guess engineers are just total geeks. God bless them. Um, I already own an electric vehicle, 13%, 10% in a year. So roughly by two to four years, and it looked like that here, people are expecting to, you know, the transition is not going to be like step function, you know. And there'll be people hanging on to them, and some of them for excellent reasons, for a long time, you know. So the thing I found fascinating was the fact that 23% of my respondents uh, either own or intend to own an EV in the next year, over 50% by 2027. You know, I think they're, they're a little more cutting edge, and I, I, I was kind of surprised by that, but there we go. But you guys parallel it very closely. So this is my first real world um, here's an interesting one, and I'm going to just throw this out and get off my knees. Um, pick your three biggest priorities. Uh, cost. Yeah, cost of ownership. Yeah, you know, carbon for range. That's, you know, like, yeah, I've been waiting, you know, I looked at the leaf, it looked like a nice carbon, 100 miles. Now they're up to 200. What is the leaf up to now? Huh? No, 
Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you had to be a real early adopter to get a hundred mile leaf, you know, and they were, um, I know this is off topic, but somebody asked me, because a buddy of mine bought one, he said, so what do you think it'll leave? I said, it's one of the ugliest cars I've ever seen until you step inside. And then it's one of the nicest cars I've ever seen. It's like the thing was just engineered for total functionality, the shape of the shape of the weird shape of the headlights. But once I got in, it's like, oh my God, all the controls are right where I want them. This is like, it's like, this is the driver's car, other than the fact that it's a little slow. It's a beauty license eyes of the beholder. Right? So, but it was a weird experience. So, how many people here consider carbon footprint a big issue for them, personally? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I'm like one of those granola launchers. Size and capacity, is that a big thing for? Physical size. Yeah, well, I mean, not so much how intimidating do you look, but, you know, how much can I carry? How many people can I carry and all that? Can I get in it? Yeah, right. And can I get in? Are there, are there ones you found that you can't get in? Really? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, be glad you were never asked to get into a Tesla Roadster. Yeah, no, no. People blackmailed me with the picture somebody took of me trying to get into a Tesla Roadster at the factory. <laughs> It was the most undignified picture I've ever had with my clothes on. They are difficult. So, you know, I know what you mean. Yeah. What about, uh, well, there was that hunger outside. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. oh, it makes me actually want to earn a higher salary. That. Oh, what a gorgeous car. Um, so, performance, how much is that an issue for? Yeah. What what can a couple of people shout out what kind of performance they consider reasonable or like really desirable? See, for me, the most important priority would be to how fast can I charge my car? If I yeah. You know, I didn't put that on there. I should have. Nick, if I ever give this, if I ever am brave enough to give this talk again. Bigger thing that you left out. What's that? How many people live in a house versus a condo or a building? Yeah. And you can't. And availability, right? And availability. Oh, yeah. No, we're in the crystal set. We are in the crystal set days. And that's one of the reasons I recommend PHEVs, um, you know, and, and hybrids. And, and hybrids. No, I, I don't disagree. And it, we are in the crystal set days. You know, we're, we're, uh, anyway, so okay, I have two two things then: charging time and availability. Yep, luxury. Is anybody here? Do you, are, are is that a big consideration? Okay, <gasps> I'm an engineer, so it's like I want to see. I want to know how it works, and I'm, as long as I I don't hurt when I get out, I'm okay. But yeah, people. Utility. Is that is utility? Let's see hands. What, what do you think? What do you What do you mean utility? The, 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 the nice lady behind me. Uh, ability to carry things, um, getting in and out of it. Um, mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and I'll get somebody from here. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a twin factor in autonomy. Autonomy meaning you're not having to go get somebody else to haul stuff for you? Uh, no, meaning that it can drive itself when I get in it. Oh, I did not thought about that. You know, I'm suspicious of automatic transmissions, so I never thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, anything. Yes. Yeah. 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 It would condense all the exhaust gas, you know, and, and it would lay in there. And if I didn't run, if it wasn't running for half an hour, 45 minutes, all that nitric acid and all the other stuff would be sitting in the rear resonator. And about every two years, I would have to, it was like, like a tank, but there it went, you know. And it's the very same thing with, very same thing with, uh, yeah, yes. We have, a, we have a wheelchair van. My wife find a wheelchair and I haven't really seen any electric um, vehicles that fit that. Oh, that'll be interesting. I, I wonder who's going to be the first one. 
that's a pretty dynamic. So well, they're usually they're you know, usually they're usually converted from minivan. Right. I haven't really seen. Yep. And you can blame to a certain extent batteries and uh, declining sales of minivans and stuff. But yeah, no, that's I like that, and that's the utility issue. The, the other thing is on cost. I priced out a new Tesla. It was fifty-seven thousand dollars. Then I went and priced out a new minivan, and it was sixty thousand dollars. Castellet. The cost is not that much of a factor anymore. What is a Castellet? Okay. You said a Castellet. No, like a minivan. Yeah, but you said the fifty thousand dollars. Tesla. Oh, Tesla. Oh, yeah, yeah. You just have to be able to get the you have to get the damn wheelchair into it. No, I'm just saying that. But the point is on cost. Yeah. It's you know fifty seven thousand dollars is not a lot for a new car anymore. Well, for, for yeah, for a lot of people, you know, for journalists, it's, no, 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 but it's true. Well, look, like if you want to look at a minivan, it's sixty thousand dollars. A truck is seventy. Yeah. Yeah, and you can pick up a, a light a Ford Lightning for fifty. Although by the time, yeah, no, thank you. This is this has been the most informative. Yes, what I always is in in my head. Maybe you could speak to it. Is resale because at some point your vehicle gets old and the batteries start to go. Who's going to want that thing? Mm -hmm. And to change the batteries out is going to be stupid numbers. So well, uh, well, it's that's changing as economies of scale change. Maybe, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's been one of the big it's one of the big things about, you know. And it's a real problem, but it's not as much of a problem. I, I have an 09 uh, Prius, same batteries because they manage them. They, they're they're fanatics about managing the batteries. Um, also, and the, what the estimate on the batteries, I mean, they, I've heard estimates of 300,000 miles out of a battery pack. They've gotten better. One of the ways you can do it is if you limit the upper range and the, in the lower discharge range. But no, it's a real problem. And I worry about it. I was thinking about getting like a used leaf just to, as a stopgap measure. And I believe me, that goes through its my, my mind. Uh, no, and, but they've got, they're getting much better at it, partly because the batteries are getting hardier and partly because the strategies for, you know, and it's also since... No, I've never bought a new car. So my motto when I taught my daughter this is you don't buy the car, you buy the owner. And so you, you know, and it's okay if somebody's just in a hurry and they're doing fast charge all the time. Right now, today's batteries don't sustain. You you can knock off half the life, you know, or at least a third. Uh, you go, oh, it's, oh, these days, come on, there's computers in there. You know, you're not buying a car, you're buying a computer that happens to have wheels. And all that history is in there and easy to access. There's a speaker this morning who referenced the point. The first two speakers. What did he say? The first two speakers. I'm not an expert, so I wouldn't care. Oh. But, but uh, Jonathan, the first speaker, and Liz, the second speaker. And Jonathan will be recorded, I think. Liz is proprietary, but hopefully, I'm sure if he has accessibility to the call. They really address that. And we we work in the current oil, and yeah. their mission statement is to track that information and yeah. the website and they're constantly updating. It's an excellent point. I I don't disagree with you. It's just thank goodness we're having solutions. Um, so the we are at is, the. So the answer is that's no longer a concern. Oh, it is it is? It's less of a concern. Our, you know. But it's an excellent point. And it's when you, if you buy a used EV, you should think about it a lot. And different manufacturers are at different levels of. Is it like the NICADs had a new memory? So you're talking that? No, it's the structure slowly breaks down. You know, um, the, the anode can accept less, the, it develops micro fissures in it and and what they call dendrites and I, I i'm by no means an expert you know i can spell dendrite but um dendrites are basically lithium that accumulates as little whiskers that run through the battery and short out parts of it you know and stuff and there's other there's a lot of other failure mechanisms that i've read i've attempted i didn't say attempted to read phd papers on um and the aging process of batteries is it's still a, it, a very big deal. Um, I'm going to give you, we're at the hour mark. And 
I'm such a fool. I'll sit here and talk at you all day, but I want to respect your time. So anybody who wants to go, and then I'll, I'll hang in for a couple more minutes. I'll try to rip through a couple of slides, and then we'll do a Q&A. But I just want to make sure I'm not wait, you know, like forcing somebody to, all right? And anybody's got to go somewhere, get them. Whoa, okay. Um, one of the things I, I just real quick, Hey, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you so much, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I found, you know, in everything, when I fly and when I drive and everything else, is considering a mission-appropriate vehicle. If you're going to go buy something, think about what's going to cover, you know, there are a lot of ways to do it. I typically say if I can get 70 to 90% of my needs met, you know, how many, when I go up on a plane, there's two of us, right? And do I want to have a plane, you know, and hauling around, getting a plane that's powerful enough and big enough to actually carry four people in luggage will almost double my fuel consumption. And it's seven and eight bucks a gallon for that stuff. Mm, no, you know, um, I'll, rent, I'll rent something else when I need it. So, you know, I'm just... Uh, yeah, here it is. Here are my notes. Mission, mission appropriate vehicles satisfy 70, 90% of your needs. They can cost as little as half the price for something that can support every task you need to do. You could go out and get a Hummer tomorrow. You could do anything in that thing. You know, call groceries, drop the kids off, you know. But at what part of this capacity are you going to, you know? Uh, anything else useful here? Well, I talked a little bit about before, you know, I won't go into my own personal history. What, what I'm doing at the moment is I've got a, a high mileage 09 Prius that gets between 35 and 50 miles to the gallon for most of my use. And then I have a hauler, you know, for the times I need to tow a trailer or whatever else. And that, that takes about 10%. That uses, uh, it's used less than 10% of the time. So that's how I'm trying to keep my carbon footprint out till I can, down until I can get, you know, get something else um preferably this thing here if it ever comes out <laughs> uh, that if you if you feel like if you if you're that's an aptera it's not for everybody it's a two place it's um it it's happy at highway speeds it has a carbon composite structure with an aluminum backbone in it and it'll do cheerfully do 100 cheerfully cruise at 80 and get anywhere that the, the entry level at $26,000 will get you 250 miles or 300 miles on a charge. Now that's obviously on a, on a warm day, you know, but, and you can get battery packs. It'll take it to a thousand miles. So if you really have, for those of you who suffer extreme range anxiety, and then the other cute thing about it is, is that those are solar panels and the company claims, I, I would take it with a couple of grains of salt. Well, on a nice sunny day, you'll get 40 miles of charge out of the roof, which is about what, you know, most people, less than what most people do to go down and pick up the groceries or God knows what, go bowling, whatever else. But that's, I figure there's a 50-50 chance of it actually coming to production. They've done some great engineering. But that's my mission of, you know, I figure that will cover 80% of my needs, you know. It's not going to cover everything, and I might have to get myself a Ford Escape. You know, I mean, if I was had money, I'd get that in a Ford Escape, which is a plug-in hybrid EV. 40 miles, 35, 40 miles of electric range, which means when I'm getting groceries, I'm not burning, I'm burning electrons, not gas. But if I have to take a camping trip, I can go somewhere and put some carbon out the tailpipe. You know, so that's and and just for people who like gorgeous, oh, that's that's the new Prius. Uh, Prius Prime, which is a hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid. But one of the one is that, right? the yellow, that gorgeous yellow thing. Wait, um, no, back up. Come on, where is it? Where are you? Yeah, there it is. So that one. One of the challenges with the one on the bottom right, right, is as soon as you get it on consumer reports crash test, pitch, right, it's going to go long distances. But if you put it up against an SUV on a legend. It's not uh, I, I've had the same concerns, and from what I can tell, I mean, their initial crash tests have been remarkable. So they're doing innovation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there it's not like it's just it's not super optimized. They've got a structure that's also designed to be, you know, take again, take that with a great a couple of grains of salt, but they are addressing it. And, yeah, and so that's another but, point. battery you like the structure of the car, and then yeah, you're in great shape. Yeah. And and there's this funny thing, one of the reasons again able to get the price down, and then I'll move on to something else, and then I'll just do q and I'll skip the last couple of slides. Um is you get a regenerative effect. The light of the car is less battery you use. And the less battery you use, the light of the car is. And you get you get a conversion point at some at some point it converges. And that's one of the reasons those cars are so reasonable. Yes. What do you think of electric conversions? I mean, we've had GM and Ford to release electric freight motors. Uh, yeah, they 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 support them criminally poorly, but I love the idea. I'm intrigued by the idea. I think they, they converted like a they converted a you know 75 Bronco. Oh, I electric. I think there's a hidden market waiting for it. I'm not knowledgeable enough to say. You know, one of the one of the bears about this is the two things are. You have to rip a car fairly fairly far apart to, to do a conversion just to figure out where to wedge the batteries, wire it, and everything else. But if you took two or three of the most popular models and developed a, a kit, it might work. One of the big things is when you... coming as crazy motor to replace the actual motor. Oh, I know. I know that. No, but what I'm saying is... Oh, I know. But then you get... I've seen... I think it's promising. I don't... I don't know if the economics, because at this would have to be, unless you were to conduct it at the wholesale level where they were, where a factory came and said, we'll buy your, some of your Ford Taurus or something. And they put them on a disassembly reassembly line. Um, it, I, I would love it. I think it's a great idea. I'm going to make a suggestion because those are a plan all along. Uh, because there are issues of uh, getting things closed up and things like that, we're running a bit over. That our plan was to have a basically a question answer interactive forum after the keynote. And we're a little bit over already on this. So I'm suggesting that maybe we stop right now and then go upstairs. I worry to death. Stop no, 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 that's not the, that's not, not, that's not the, well, we'll reconvene. we're going to, uh, we're going to reconvene upstairs in front of the, our, our, uh, the banquet hall. And if you're not staying for the banquet, you're still welcome to stick around. We have some refreshments. I don't know how long they'll last, but we have some refreshments we're going to bring out up there. And then the uh, banquet starts at 630 and uh, I'll get uh, Lee up there. And any of the other speakers who would like to say a few words? Karen, you want to say something? Yes, uh, uh, we, that, but we can talk about that upstairs. But I, I do like to particularly one of the key sponsors we have here is, uh, is PSENG. We can talk that up there uh, through. Uh, the fellow put together uh, a great deal of what is making this program streaming work. Uh, and that is, uh, is uh, Lou uh, and his country company. Uh, I don't, don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, here, uh, is sponsoring it. The College of New Jersey plays a big factor in, in bringing us over here. Uh, my own company, which uh, is now uh, 